with Philippians. Just stay on a roll. Uh, we're going to revisit a little short <clears throat> book in the Bible called Philemon, or uh, however you want to pronounce it. That's how I say it. Uh, next week, and, th and that's what we'll be doing. That's what I'll be preparing for. But we're thankful for these guys. And glad they're going to get a, get to get away, and uh, we'll be we'll be praying for y'all. Sure. Um, I want to introduce to y'all, if you haven't met, Zelma, uh, Daugherty, right? That's what it's close enough. Daugherty. 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 Okay, thank you. We'll probably butcher it a few times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it won't be the first time you have to correct me. So, uh, uh, But Zelma was with us some months ago when we were meeting out at the gym, uh, and she's from Troy, and uh, the Havards have crossed paths with, with Zelma, and... Uh, so uh, she's back. She's had some back issues and so forth, but she's back, and, and uh, glad you're here. This is a pretty good group. Yeah. I hope you're welcome. It, it hope feels good to be back. This is the first time that I, well, I was going to, to go to Sunday school thing yeah. there, but it's nice to be in a classroom with fellowship <laughs> again with people yeah. going yeah. to Sunday school yeah. class. So. And so, uh, and then she just threw it out there, but I, I am amazed. This sister is 90 years old. She threw it out there in front of people. Wow. So that's I, amazing. I, I, but what I want is, I just want to affirm her. That is, I give awesome. Man, awesome. You're my hero. Yeah. You're my hero. Yeah. So send me your vitamins and you eat. We're going to show you. Yeah, I want, I want what she's doing. Yeah, I want what she's doing. Yeah. And so, uh, but thanks, thanks, thanks for being here, Selma. The Lord is good. Yeah, yeah. 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 All the time. All the time. And so, uh, if we, uh, uh, Zemo, what we do is we pray. Uh, we, the board back here is our prayer board. And when people have prayer concerns, they write it on the board. And then we just pray right off of, uh, right off of that. And uh, I think I can see everything but the last one. I see Melissa's head. Oh, but Sharon. Last one. Sharon, okay. This one's okay. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, if you notice, there's different um, letters by each one. And they're different colors. Because that's just the weird way that I work. But uh, uh, I want to be thinking in terms, that it's got an R by it, then it's Jehovah Rapha, our healer. If it's got a J by it, it's Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Um, the S is Shama, Jehovah Shama, his presence. And then, of course, he's many more things than that. Uh, it, but as, as we pray and gather. So when you hear me grouping these together, that's, that's why we're doing that. Okay? And then after we pray, Janice has something she wants to share, mm -hmm. and uh, then Mark will jump up and get going. Yes, ma'am. Can we add to that prayer list this morning? Sure. Uh, to the Kimber family, there was um, an accident, a death, and oh. uh, Brad's brother, Brett. Oh. Brett, my yeah. boss's brother, the other Brad, Brett yeah. Kimber's brother. Yeah. Okay. So unexpected, so, unexpectedly passed away. Oh, okay. So the Kimber family, <coughs> you know, his wife just... Teresa and their daughter Kendall and Kennedy. Okay, and, and the brother's name was. Brett. Brett, Brett. Okay, okay. Yeah, we were just by their house, and, and I called him when we drove by, and I called his wife. I mean, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, and it happened Monday. The uh, funeral was yesterday morning. Ah, uh, yep. Okay. Down in um, uh, China Springs. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Okay, well, let, let me to pray, and then uh, we'll get going. Father, uh, mm -hmm. just right off the bat, I just want to lift up the Kimbrough family. Um, Father, we know that um, that privilege that we have to cross over from this life to your presence is a beautiful thing but father when it comes suddenly like that and uh again just the, the grief and the heartache and uh so we just pray as the god of comfort and the prince of peace that you will minister to brad and trish and their whole family and wife Teresa, to, to to everyone that's involved kids grandkids um uh father just minister your comfort in a special way and just remind us to reach out and, and minister to the Kimbros during this time. We just thank you for that precious family. And Father, uh, as uh, our um, uh, Jehovah Rapha, our healer, I want to bring before you Jacob for the pathology we're waiting on. Father, for uh, Kathy McQueen, still with the cancer for, for Madison, Father, as she continues going through her uh, um, therapy and uh, father and for for uh, Robin and, and Jason while he's he's gone and the brothers and just minister this precious family father we just love you so much and they love you so much and we love them so much and so 
Uh, Father Adam and Natalie, uh, we prayed for that precious baby, and now we're praying Jehovah Jireh for that job uh, to come uh, that Adam can identify. And Father, and then continually Josh and Lindsay as we're expecting this precious gift in, in, in August and getting ready for a shower, just let us celebrate with them in a special way and just just be with Lindsay during this whole process, Father. For, for Curtis, um, uh, his second cousin that had a miscarriage, we just pray your healing. Father, for Steve and Judy Walker, um, uh, again, Father, for peace, for comfort um, during this, this very difficult journey in this time in their life as Steve uh, walks through this, uh, this cancer and all that's involved with that right now. Bradley Fair, we, we pray the same. We thank you for the fact that he was able to go home and, and that he is doing well. Father, we thank you too. Jerry Tyler will be coming back to work tomorrow and after her hip replacement. We thank you for the for the relief that you've given her through that. And Father, for Sharon White's uh, mom, Betty Sue. Uh, Father, and, and, and Stony Brook and all the folks there that when they had this bouts of, of COVID that spread through, uh, Father, we ask uh, uh, you to be with each one. And for Kelly, Father, as he's awaiting some job interview information and, mm -hmm. and to see what the results are there and for the selling of Betty Sue's house, Father. All of that on their plate right now. And uh, so we just ask you to be with the whites. Father, uh, BBS is about to crank up mm -hmm. and, and I just pray that uh, for the leaders, I pray for the children, I pray for the families of the children. I pray, Father, that you will uh, just continue to uh, use BBS as, as a wonderful mm -hmm. tool to engage families and reach out and love and minister and tell the story of Jesus. Father, for Michael uh, Cunningham, uh, also deploy Jehovah Shammah, mm -hmm. your presence right where he's at, just as we pray for Jason, you're right where he's at and you have him and you have them and we just pray for really all of our guys and gals all over the world. Amanda uh, McDonald and uh, her pregnancy issue, Father, we uh, again just call on you as our healer and physician and I also just call on you Prince of Peace because I know that that must be a very, very anxious, uh, anxious time for them. And as Barb continues to remind us, uh, Father, let us not drive by a campus anywhere on the, in our cities, in our county, to our CS school bus, anything, walk through Walmart and see all the school supplies. Father, let us just bathe uh, our schools in prayer yes. and the teachers and the administrators and the children that will be coming in. <coughs> just pray that it's a safe place, but a place to uh, where your presence is felt in a very powerful way, Father. So. We just love you. The Good News Clubs are about to begin, so we, we ask, Father, that you have uh, plenty of workers and get in the campuses and just love on those kids. Mm -hmm. So just be with us right now, and if there are any unspoken, uh, the hickeys aren't here today because uh, they're dealing with the COVID right now. So mm -hmm. be with Jimmy and, um, and Sandra with that, and as well as the Shuttlesworth, Dave and Vicki. And just continue to be with them. Be with Pastor today as he preaches. Be with Mark as he's about to teach. And we just love you and praise you. And this is your time. We give it to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So Janice, we have a quick yes. announcement. And Mark. We had to put off our third baby shower. <laughs> <laughs> because the crew got sick. So we have rescheduled. Lindsay and Josh is celebrating their new arrival. Uh, we're going to do it Jan oh, January. We're going to do it set, uh, Saturday the 13th from 2 to 4. And right over here, hopefully in Turner Hall. But we'll be putting that out again next week as well as in the Sunday school announcement. So Yolanda wanted me to go ahead and mention it to everybody so you can get it on the calendar. Thank you all for that. I'm sorry, real quick. Today is Jason's birthday, so if y'all have his number, or if you want his number, um, if you could text him and just wish him happy birthday. And also, I have his address, so if anyone's interested, he doesn't need anything. Um, he's, he's got plenty of stuff, doesn't have a lot of space, but if you just want to send him a card or anything, I've got his address. I'll gladly share it. Um, you get going, I'm just going to write on the board here. Okay. Right there. Okay. Wonderful. But yeah, if you need his number, have him, he'd love to hear. He's already passed his birthday at this point. They're several hours ahead of us, but definitely send a text or whatever you'd love that. Awesome.
So, I was planning on finishing up chapter two today, but because Charlie talks long, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not promising anything. Now. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, we're talking about spiritual unity, and I'm going to I'm going to jump back just a little bit to to pick up what we already talked about last week, and we were going to continue on this week and. It's talking about when Jesus came to this earth and what he gave up to come to earth, okay, in his incarnation. And so he emptied himself out of certain things, and he did this willingly. He did this for me. He did this for you. And I, I, I just ask that as we talk through this, that you just think about... <coughs> the magnitude of what Jesus emptied himself of at the end of the day. So the first one is, if we look at Philippians 2, 7, uh, but he made himself nothing. Um, when you think about that, he made himself, so this is king of kings and lord of lords. Uh, he was absolutely full of deity, but he emptied himself of all his prerogatives, everything that he had, okay? Emptied is from the Greek word kinu, which means to completely empty. That means there's nothing left. The Son of God emptied himself of five divine rights that we're going to talk about. The first one, he temporarily emptied himself of his divine glory. So when you think about that, you think about, here's the king of king and lords of lord in heaven. I'm going to wait because I, I see everybody looking at me. I wrote five divine rights. Got glory right there. So I, I so, was with you. So let's, we'll continue. <laughs> there we go. Thank you for your great Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Did you get that back? I got it. Likewise, everybody got it? You. So, how many are right? Five divine. Five. Five divine. Divine. glory. <laughs> exactly. So we read in John 17, 1, Jesus spoke these things, and lifting, lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. So again, when he came down, he left that glory. He gave that up. He emptied himself of that glory. In John 17, 5, it says, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So, I mean, you got the King of kings and Lord of lords that said, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to step out of my glory. I'm going to come to this earth for you and for me. I mean, I, we can just think about that all day long. I mean, and, and my encouragement to you as I studied this this week is just to think about what that looks like. I mean, I can't wrap my head around it. I can't put words enough to to fully understand what that means other than what Jesus said, Father glorify me with the glory I had. Okay? So, uh, number two, Jesus emptied himself of independent divine authority. The operation of the Trinity, of course, a great mystery. Within the Godhead, there is a perfect harmony and great agreement in every possible way and to every possible degree. You know, there's no conflict with the Trinity, but yet we can't fully wrap our mind around what the Trinity is. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're all God, but they're all unique. They each have their purpose, okay? But there's never any conflict either. So Jesus un unambiguously stated his full equality with the Father when he declared, I and the Father are one, John 10, 30, okay? So again... We talked a little bit about this last week, that the inerrancy of the scriptures, okay? So I personally believe there, there are no errors. When, when God gave us his word, 
Every word is true in it. So when we read his word, there, there's nothing in my mind that I go, well, is that, is that really accurate at the end of the day? I just believe it. For me, I'm, I'm just being transparent on my journey uh, as a Christian. You know, early in my early walk with the Lord, I would read things that I didn't understand, and I was kind of like, well, that didn't make sense to me. But I had to get to a point where I go, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And if he can do that, there's nothing else in here that he can't do, okay? And so when you read God's word, and, and we'll, talk, we'll, we'll look at so many verses today, you know, you look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, and you can, you can read a verse over here, and there's a string attached over here that'll crinkle another page. It's just all woven together. There is no way possible that this could not be divinely inspired. Amen. Okay? So, uh, again, yet he, he just as clearly declared during his incarnation that I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me, John 5.30. So think about that. He's in heaven with full authority, but when he steps out as a baby and grows up as a man, fully God, fully man, he gave up that authority, and everything he does is from the Father, and he's in total obedience to the Father. And why is that important? Because if he's in total obedience, and we are children of God, that implies that we should be totally obedient. Does that make, am I making sense? So, third thing, Jesus emptied himself of the voluntary exercise of some of his divine attributes, though not, though not the essence of his deity. He did not stop being omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, and immutable. He chose not to exercise the full limit of those attributes during his earthly life and ministry. So just think about that. All of those attributes, and he chose not to use them. Oh, well, uh, Mark, didn't he give up his omniscience, you know, the knowing? Hang on. Okay. Thank, thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank, thank you for that. No, appreciate that. Absolutely. We're going we're gonna to talk about that. But, but that he gave up those voluntarily. Here's the king of kings and lord of lords at the end of the day. So, he did not, he did, however, exercise some of them selectively and partially. Thank you, sir. Without having met him, Jesus knew omnisciently that Nathaniel was an Israelite. This is just an example. In whom there was no deceit. Because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man, John 147 and 225. Through his omnipresence, he knew where Nathaniel was before he saw him in John 148. Yet he confessed that as to the exact time of his return, of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone, Matthew 2436. So he gave up that right as co-equal that only the Father knows that at the end of the day. So the fourth thing, Jesus emptied himself of eternal riches. For the sake, for your sake, he became poor, Paul explains, so that you through his poverty might become rich, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Man, he left heaven. Eternal riches to come to this earth for you and me. It's just hard for me to wrap my head around the the, the magnitude's not even the right word. I mean, I mean, it, it 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 expresses the bigness of it, but yet it doesn't encompass it. If that makes sense. The point of this is not that Christ gave up Earth's riches, but that He gave up heaven's riches. There's a difference there. He emptied himself temporarily of his unique, intimate, and face-to-face -face relationship with his heavenly father, even to the point of being forsaken by him. Mm -hmm. 
To fulfill the divine plan of redemption, the Father made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. Wow. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. You know, the word here, Mark, that comes to me is love. We, we can't fathom. Yeah. We can't begin to understand that kind of love. It, it, that, it, we can't. I, it, it, I thought of that a lot this week of, of because above all, you must have love for one another. And it's like, how do you wrap your head around that? And we'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. Christians obviously cannot empty themselves to the degree that the Lord emptied himself because he started so high and Christians start so low. Believers have infinitely less to empty themselves of. Even what we have is given to us by his grace. Believers are obligated to follow the Lord's example by emptying themselves of everything that would hinder the obedience and service to him. So when you think about that as our, in our daily walk, you know, everything we do and say, we have to ask ourselves, are we being obedient? Are we following the guidelines, the, the laws, the commandments that God gave us? Yet we all know that we're sinners, even saved. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, when we talk about sanctification. So, in, in Philippians 2.7b, it says, Taking the form of a bond servant. So we're still talking about Jesus here. Jesus forsook the, forsook the full rights of lordship by taking the form of a bond servant. A doulos... Greek word, bondservant, owned nothing, not even the clothes on his back. Everything he had, including his life, belonged to his master. Jesus did own his clothes, but he, he owned no land or house, no gold or jewels. He owned no business, no boat, no horse. He had to borrow a donkey to ride into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He borrowed a room at the inn for the Last Supper and even was buried in a borrowed tomb. He refused any property, any advantages, any special service to himself relative to his glory. The King of Kings and Lord of Lords willingly became a bondservant of bondservants. Mm -hmm. So he left heaven. It's not like he left heaven and was <coughs> king on earth. He was a servant on earth. Now he's coming back one day as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Man, I wish I could do Woo! <laughs> I mean, that, that should make us get excited. Did I do that pretty good? Y'all yeah. <laughs> weren't expecting that. Okay. Uh, Are you okay? You're, you're okay. I didn't. I didn't. I'm good. I might do it again here in a second. So, so I'm going to tell y'all as, as, as we study Philippians, you know, we looked at chapter one and we learned, and we look at chapter two. You know, chapter 3 and chapter 4, they just, it's like it's building up to this big crescendo, and it's just hard to contain. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. Uh, Through his provision of salvation, Jesus served others more completely than any other servant or slave who has ever lived. But he was an example of servanthood for his disciples to follow. He reminded them that a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master in Matthew 10, 24. We've been bought with a price. We are bond slaves if we call ourselves Christians. We're not above our master at the end of the day. He's given us the model, the example that we should all follow. In uh, Philippians 2, 7, C, we see that taking on the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. So in being, being made in the likeness of men, God made him thus by his miraculous conception and virgin birth. Likeness refers to that which is made to be like something else, not just in appearance, but in reality. So even though God came to this earth, Again, he was fully man. He was birthed just like you and me. 
everything about him was fully man. He experienced everything that we experience. We'll talk more about that. He became exactly like all other human beings, have all the attributes of humanity, a genuine man among men. He was so obviously, he was so obviously like other human beings that even his family and disciples would not have known his deity had not the angels revealed it to them. Matthew 1, 20 and 21, Luke 1, 26 through 35, and Luke 2, 9 through 11. So just as common, you know, to see Jesus walking down the street, we wouldn't have recognized him. He was just a man. You know, there wasn't, he wasn't, I don't know this, he wasn't this handsome man that stood out, you know. Uh, he wasn't, uh, you know, a bodybuilder with physical, you know, attributes that made him stand out. I'm just, I'm just throwing out stuff at the, at the end of the day. He was a common, uncommon man. Does that make, am I making sense on that? So, the next one, Philippians 2, 8a, says, being found in appearance as a man. So, again, advancing the truth that he was made in the likeness of men, having been made a true human being by divine power through the virgin conception, Christ was found or recognized as a man by those who saw and observed him during his incarnation. Je Jesus suffered the added humil humiliation of being considered a mere man. You step out of heaven, you accept the role of a bond servant, but think about how you and I would be if you were, you know, the president of the United States and you lost everything and you had to walk, you, you couldn't go the places that you used to, who were honored with at the end of the day, how humiliating that would be at the end of the day. And I'm not trying to compare that, I'm just trying to say, uh, from a human perspective, we focus on the wrong things of, of what, what is good and right at the end of the day. Am I making sense? So that, that humbleness. So step, uh, step six, he humbled himself, Philippians 2, 8b. Paul says that Jesus humbled himself. The emphasis here moves from Jesus' nature, what we've just talked about, and, and form to that of his personal attitude, okay? He humbled himself. So that was a choice by Jesus to do that. All right? So that would tell us that that should be a choice for us at the end of the day. Mars, you yes. Mm. Well done. Well done, buddy. Um, it just doesn't hold water when we whine mm -hmm. and, and talk about maybe our flaw and we go that's just the way I am mm -hmm. you know and we try to justify the behavior mm -hmm. uh, that's just the way I am when in reality he's saying we just just as I am <laughs> as he is as he's living through us as Lord and and uh, because we're just so excuse makers uh, and whiners and so that, that that's beautiful no what it, you it said there it, it, it kind of takes away all our excuses. <laughs> you know, when you look at these verses, I mean, it's like, it, it, you know, I, I told Melissa I wasn't going to talk about her today, but I'm going to talk about her. <laughs> Sorry, Melissa. No, <laughs> no but, but what Charlie said, you know, uh, you know, I'm sure Melissa and I are unique in this. You know, every week, you know, sometimes there might be something that rubs one of us the wrong way, okay? I'm sure we're unique in that. In that. Sure you are. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're striving to be like y'all. Okay? <laughs> but, you know, what Charlie said, you know, having studied it, it's like every time something would come up, the Holy Spirit would go, hey, Mark, hey. Are you going to act right? Yeah. <laughs> or are you going to whine and complain because, hey, 
she did something to me and it wasn't right. Okay. I'm not saying that's a true statement. I'm just saying <laughs> I'm just saying in my flesh. Exactly. In my flesh, I didn't feel like it was the right thing. Am I making, am I making sense? But man, it is so Jesus chose to humble himself. Uh, humble himself translates. Uh, it has the ideal of lying low. Jesus lowered himself, not only relative to God, but also to other men. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, sir. Can I get on my soapbox? You can. Okay, at the risk of getting on the soapbox. But but just for a short period of time. Okay. <laughs> just, just, just a soap bar. Soap um, bar. <laughs> dial. Um, <coughs> to me, it's hard for us to, to really fathom the idea that Jesus grew up, that Jesus was a boy, that lost his front teeth, that skinned his knees, that climbed trees, that busted his thumb with a hammer, you know, and cried. Um, and it's hard for us to fathom that because all we read about is Jesus in his in his in his work. Um, but he grew up as, as a young boy. I mean, he was, a, he was a kid. He did the same things that we did, so to speak. And to me, the beauty of the whole thing is because he experienced all of that. Yes. Because he experienced betrayal and hatred. We can't go to God and say, you don't understand. <laughs> he said, wait a minute. You know, I understand <laughs> Been there, done that, Bucko. You know, so you know that's kind of my that's my song. No, I, I, I very couldn't have said it better. I mean, that's that's. Well, you probably could have, but anyway. Well, no, it, 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 it's sort of like suck it up, Bucko. <laughs> I mean, you know, because you understand what I mean. It's absolutely, like, like he understands, and we have, we need to understand that he knows. Mm -hmm. he yes, knows what it's yeah. like. Except when he hit his thumb. He said, hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He had to because, you know, exactly. wonder. <laughs> the most dramatic, poignant time of Jesus' self-abasement, we're getting ready to go here, was during his arrest, trial, and crucifixion. He was mocked, falsely accused, spat upon, beaten with fists, scourged, and had part of his beard pulled, painfully plucked out. Yet he was never defensive, never bitter, never demanding. He refused to assert his rights as God, even as a human being. Wow. We just, we camp out there all day long. I mean, it just, it's. It, Number seven, be, by becoming obedient to the point of death, Philippians 2, 8c. Jesus' obedience and its, and its impact on redemption is the theme of Romans 5, 12 through 19, where the key thought is through, through the obedience of one, the many will be made righteous, verse 19. One would think that someone, somewhere short of the ultimate sacrifice, he would have said, it is enough. But his perfect submission took him all the way to death because that was the will of the Father. Mm -hmm. Man. Long before his arrest, Jesus declared, For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. John 10, 17. Because Jesus' mindset was set entirely on God's interests, not man's or his own, he willingly and gladly became obedient to the point of death. So remember last week, we talked about, you know, when you're plowing and the blinders, you know, this is where Jesus was. His whole focus was on God the Father and his obedience to the Father. Because... I lay down my life so that I may take it up again for you and me. Because if you didn't take it up again, we wouldn't have salvation. So the father did not force death upon the son. It was the father's will, but it was the son's will always to perfectly obey the father. Even death on a cross, Philippians 2, 8D. 
there were many ways by which he could have been killed. He could have been beheaded, such as John the Baptist, or stoned or hanged. But he was destined not for just any kind of death, but for death on a cross. Crucifixion is probably the most cruel, excruciating, painful, and shameful form of execution ever conceived. It was reserved for slaves, the lowest of criminals, and enemies of the state. No Roman citizen was even crucified. In his book, The Life of Christ, Frederick Farr describes crucifixion as follows. A death by crucifixion seems to include all that pain and death can have of the horrible and ghastly. Dizziness, cramps, thirst, starvation, sleeplessness, traumatic fever, shame, publicity of shame, long continuance of torment, horror of anticipation, mortification of intended wounds, all intensified just up to the point at which they can be endured at all, but all stopping just short of the point which would give the sufferer the relief of unconsciousness. The unnatural position made every movement painful. The lacerated veins and crushed tendons throbbed with incessant anguish. But God, in his perfect plan, the crucifixion of his son, not only was acceptable, but was mandatory. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, Paul explains, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, Galatians 3.13. As Peter declares, he himself bore our sins, his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by wounds you were healed, 1 Peter 2.24. In God's infinite wisdom, death on a cross was the only way of redemption for falling, sinful, and condemned mankind. After reflection on the divine plan of salvation for the first 11 chapters of Romans, Paul declared in awe and wonder, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable ways. Romans 11.33 Man. You know, it, it's... it's um, it tugs on my emotions, but at the same time it tugs on it. We're reading the epistle of joy, and that joy, knowing that Jesus did that for me, did that for you, you know, it's just it's hard to reconcile those two things at the end of the day. And it even gets better, verses 9 through 11. Could somebody read that in chapter 2? Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> This this is called the exaltation of Christ. Okay? So in the next three verses, Paul briefly describes the magnificent and unequaled exaltation that the Father then bestowed on the Son. No passage of scripture more beautifully portrays the depth of condescension and the height of exaltation experienced by Jesus than does Philippians 5, 2, 5, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. The epistle of joy, remember? So this is Hebrews 12, 2. It was because of the joy set before him that Christ endured the cross despising the shame as he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy set before him. So Jesus endured all of this for the joy set before him. Man, hang on, it gets better. In verses 2, 1 through 4, as we have looked at, Paul establishes that the 
practical result of believers following the Lord's example of humility is unity in the church. Amen. So remember, we're talking, this whole thing is talking about the unity of the body. Melissa and I have experienced a, you know, a, a church split, the disunity, because men <laughs> did not look at the scriptures. Their pride rose above Amen. what the scriptures say. Because you can't do that if you're following the word of God. It just In this day of excessive pride, self-love, and self-promotion, even among many professing Christians, it is important to understand that whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, Matthew 23, 12. Just as surely as God gives grace to the humble, he is opposed to the proud, 1 Peter 5, 5. Everything we see today is men... <coughs> women their pride rising up does everybody know who mayor bloomberg is <laughs> he was the mayor of new york he's a billionaire uh he owns bloomberg news it's financial somebody asked him he said uh are you going to heaven mayor bloomberg this was his answer he said when i get to the gates of heaven I'm going to walk right past St. Peter, straight up to God, and tell him what I've done. Wrong. Wrong. Yeah. Wrong. Yeah. Wrong. Yeah. But can you imagine the pride, the arrogance, the, the, but yet, you know. Oh, it's going to be a little walk. warmer than he anticipated, I think. Pardon me? It's going to be a little warmer than he anticipated. <laughs> it is. Anyway, these are the wrong gates. We pray, though. He just doesn't know. He doesn't know. We pray that he comes to a saving faith Amen. because he'll confess that sin. Yeah. Yes. And and we know that Pastor Bob's already talked to us about you know revelation and the end time. So humility is the key to the unity of the church for which which the apostle is so, so strongly appealing. It is the key for believers to be truly one in Jesus Christ as he is one with the Father, John 17, 21. Oh, I've already, sorry, got it. But for those who followed the Lord's example of humility, who have this attitude, remember, Jesus chose the attitude that he had, who have this attitude in themselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, Philippians 2, 5, there is a promise of great reward. Like their master, they will be exalted by the heavenly Father. As Jesus promised, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself should be exalted. Matthew 23, 12, Luke 14, 11, and Luke 18, 14. Peter wrote, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. 1 Peter 5, 6. Philippians 2, 5 through 11 is not simply a picture of humiliation and exaltation of the Son of God. It is a profound illustration of a divine principle that brings immeasurable blessings to God's obedient and humble servants. So it's instruction. Yes, sir. I just wanted to share just a thought about pride. You know, to God, sin is sin, and we're all sinners. But pride is an insidious thing, and I think the devil does an amazing mm -hmm. amount of work mm -hmm. getting into our being and getting involved in our lives through pride. For years... Now, this may, does not make sense, but I felt that I was unprideful. I actually took pride. I didn't really care about fancy cars or fancy house or, you know, and I took pride in the fact that I did that. You blew it. Thank you. Thank you. It's deception. Yeah. It, exactly. <laughs> Trying to be obedient, we became un in, in, in obedient. So, hey, we've all done that. You just buy a Corvette, you'll feel better. <laughs> <laughs> so you're that pride in that thing. Yes. That's why, that's why humility. Yeah. You know, yeah. the minute you, you find out you're humble, you're, you're exactly. not. Exactly. You know. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. By God's matchless yeah. grace, just as they are humbled with Christ, they will also be glorified. Paul presents four aspects of the Father's exaltation of the Son. In verse uh, 29a, the source, 29b, the title, 29, or 2, 10, and 11, the response, and 211b, 
the purpose. For this reason, God highly exalted him. So the source is God in 2.9a. For this reason refers back to Jesus' humiliation. So God's saying, for this reason, in verse, verses 6 and 8, I'm going to exalt him. His exaltation was the joy set before him that we found in Hebrews 12, 2 and 3. Highly exalted translates from the compound verb. I'm not going to do good at this. Hooper upso, composed <laughs> of hooper, which means over, and hoopso, to lift or raise up. God lifted up his beloved son in the most magnificent way possible. It involved four steps of going of it involved four steps upward his resurrection his ascension his coronation and his intercession jesus was resurrected from the dead by the father ephesians 120 jesus ascension paul explained to timothy jesus was taken up into glory first timothy 316 jesus's coronation when giving the great commission jesus proclaimed all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. Having ascended, Jesus is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven. And then Jesus' exaltation is his honored position as high priest from which he continually intercedes for the believers. So when we talked about Jesus experiencing everything that we, we, we go through as humans, ultimately he's the high priest that understands everything that we go through because as we've talked about he lived as a little boy he was born he lived he experienced all the pains that we've gone through for the most part Jesus's exaltation involved the restoration of what he eternally possessed before his incarnation okay in his high priestly prayer prayer he employed now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world, John 17, 5. He was not any more divine or any more perfect when he ascended. He could not be any further elevated, okay? Yet, because of his perfect redemptive work, the Father bestowed on the Son even more rights and privileges and responsibilities as he had before. What else did he get? after he ascended any thoughts he's now the final judge John 5 22 to 23 that was what he received he is now the high priest which he continually <laughs> intercedes as high priest if he if he ever had never been touched with the feeling of their infirmities our infirmities including being tempted in every way as they are, he could not have fully identified with, it, with us and therefore been able to strengthen and encourage them in their temptations. Hebrews 2.18, 4.15, 9.28, 1 Peter 2.24. The title of Christ's exaltation and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So what is that name? Jesus. Jesus. Father, yeah. Jesus, Savior, but it, the name is going to be bestowed on him. So he had Jesus when he lived on this earth. And, oh, by the way, Jesus was a common name in those times. So the Father conferred upon the name, upon the Son, the name which is above every name, the most divinely perfect love. Having become as much better than the angels, the writer of Hebrews explains, he inherited a much more excellent name than they. Hebrews 1.4. The name is incomparable. It's the superlative of superlatives. Paul reveals in verse 11, the name that every tongue will confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. Mm -hmm. Lord. Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Lord of Lords and King of Kings. That's what's bestowed upon him now. Every, every knee is not going to bow at the name of Jesus, but every knee will bow at Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
That, am I making sense on that? Lord is the title of majesty, authority, honor, and sovereignty. One day that exalted name will be expanded to King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Revelation 19, 16. So when he comes back, he's not coming back as a bond servant. He's coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Whether you bend your knees on your, on your own volition or whether he bends your knees because he's the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, you will bow before yeah. whew, God Almighty. Is that a woo? <laughs> I couldn't get the woo out. <laughs> 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 Already praise. <laughs> <Right. laughs> I hear you. I hear you. So, let me. Gracious. There's, too, I got, there's a lot of stuff in here, guys. I'm telling you. Um, the response of Christ's exaltation in verses 2, 10 through 11a. The Greek of so that and will bow and will confess is saying, Jesus is given the name which is above every name for the purpose that or with the result every knee will bow and those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess the supreme name Jesus Christ. It is, it is critical to understand that this response will not be to the name Jesus, a form of Joshua meaning Jehovah or Yahweh saves. Jesus was a common name in the New Testament times. It obviously could not be unique, much less supreme. The name intended by God is a title of exaltation. It is rather at the name of Jesus that is at another name, Lord, given to Jesus Christ, in his exaltation by the Father that every knee will bow and every tongue confess. In this present text, Lord obviously refers to Jesus' deity and sovereignty, exalted authority in the highest sense, ultimate whether by choice or by force, every creature, every human, angelic host will submit to Jesus Christ as the divine Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go through this. The purpose of Christ's exaltation to the glory of God the Father. Jesus' exaltation is the glory of God the Father. So think about that. Jesus' exaltation, what he's being lifted up to, is to the glory of God the Father. How does that work? To proclaim the sovereign lordship of his son is the greatest glory that can be given to God the Father. So think about that. Christ's universal acknowledgement as Lord does not make the Father jealous. Instead, that is the supreme objective and fulfillment of the Father's divine will as he demonstrates his perfect love for his son. So when you're thinking about that, it, I think of my son and, you know, to see him... This is human terms, okay? Uh, to see him aspire to something that makes him successful, and I don't mean in success for the sake of success. For Melissa and I, we would be proud. It would bring, you know, we would look at that and go, man, my son. But be, uh, that's a very poor example of saying, <laughs> because of the son's obedience, to the Father, it brought, brought great joy to bestow upon him the glory that he is going to receive. And there's no conflict there. Am I making sense on that? I, I might have messed that up a little bit. Herein, of course, is a great mystery, a mystery that confounds everyone who presumes to fully understand the, the Trinity. The three persons are but one God, holy, unified, and indivisible. We've already talked about it. They never compete. They never disagree. They never dis, uh, uh, differ with one another. Jesus explained the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify himself. John 13, 31 through 32. So as Jesus receives glory, the Father receives glory because they're God. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, that's Romans 9, 5, Romans 11, 36, and 16, 27. It is the Father's 
and the Son's supreme pleasure to glorify each other. Think about that. That's what Melissa thinks when she thinks of me. It's her <laughs> job to glorify me. <laughs> Some of you got it. There are those that are laughing. And I'll pay for this. <laughs> In his high priestly prayer, Jesus said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. He was perfect in his obedience to God's glory, and therefore the Father glorified him. I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the works which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, which the glory which I had with you before the world was. John 17, 1 and 4 through 5. Whoever honors the Son honors the Father, and whoever dishonors the Son dishonors the Father, John 5, 23. Through all eternity, the Father will continue to say of the exalted Lord Jesus Christ, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We're going to stop there today. Hey. Good job. Good job, buddy. And uh, and just for record, if we'd have started at 6 a.m., you wouldn't have finished. <laughs> Pray, praise God. Praise God. We're on, king, we're on kingdom schedule. Uh, and uh, so we're not in any hurry. Good job, buddy. Thank you so much. Um, and um, again, as we go, uh, let's just continue to pray for the fosters as they go have some R and R, our time. And um, remember the hickeys that aren't here because of the COVID, and and just be safe out there. Uh, my prayer is for wisdom for our country, for our church, for so we don't go crazy on this thing again, mm -hmm. but that we deal with it responsibly, whatever whatever that looks like, and. Um, uh, just trust and trust the Lord with a big time. Zama, thank you for being here. Oh, and we my appreciate pleasure. you come back. I hope you'll come back again. Okay. I'll be back. And so yeah. if y'all allow me to, to close in prayer. Father, we love you, praise you. I thank you for my brother Mark. Thank you for the enthusiasm that you have given him to dig and to, to present your, your the truth of your word. Mm -hmm. And we do pray for him and Mel as they go uh, get a little family time and R and R. But right now, Father, I pray that you've prepared our hearts well, not only in here through Philippians, but as we go enter into our corporate worship and, and be with Pastor Bob as he, uh, again, guides us through the scripture for Brother Bob as he leads us in, in, uh, in worship and music. And Father, then as we leave this place today and, and drive off this property, remembering that we're entering our mission field mm -hmm. to take you with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Thanks, <laughs>